Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Brave TV. I'm Jen Marshall, co-founder and executive director of This Is My Brave, and I am so excited to be doing this special episode with Jason Wood. Um, Jason recently uh, shared his story with us through our blog, and it's a, it's a unique perspective because I feel like we don't talk enough about men and dealing with disordered eating. And so for Eating Disorder Awareness Week, we wanted to invite Jason to have this conversation with us about his story, his decision to open up and, and share what he's gone through and how he's been building his recovery. And um, I'm going to let him introduce himself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Jason, and where you're from and what you do. And, and then we'll dive into the conversation. All right. Thanks so much, Jen. And hello, everyone. I'm Jason Wood. And uh... Let's see, a little bit about me. I just moved out here to Denver back in uh, 2019, originally born and raised in Chicago. So uh, if I pronounce my A's all funny, that's in Chicago. <laughs> um, I married my wonderful husband back in 2019 as well. So that was a big year for us. And uh, we keep it busy with our two pups here at home, Arnie and Walter. And uh, we just love exploring our new home here in Denver too. Um, there's just so much to see outdoors and uh, it's just a great place. So um, it's it's kind of ironic because I feel like I'm in a really good place in my own life right now and I'm living in a great place too. So I can't complain too much. That's awesome. I've always wanted to get out more to Denver. And as we were discussing before we hopped on, um, we've had two shows out in Denver. So uh, we have some storytellers, some alums that live out there. You may bump into them one day, um, but uh, Let's go into, dive right into your story. So I was so touched by your, your coming out post basically about um, living with orthorexia. And it caught my eye because not only because you're, you're a man, but you know, it's an eating disorder that we don't know much about. It's not commonly talked about. And will you, will you take us through kind of the beginning stages of your journey? Cause it, it kind of stemmed from childhood, right? Yeah, yeah, it started, and the scariest thing about orthorexia for me was the fact that it kind of lurked around for more than half of my life, and I didn't even know what it was until I was well into recovery. So um, it kind of started off, uh, I was overweight as a child, um, had always struggled, kind of feeling a little bit intimidated by the bullies and stuff at school because I didn't have the same body like everybody else did. So I kind of held that a little self-conscious. And then fast forward to high school, I decided to uh, join Weight Watchers. It was a great opportunity to uh, learn about healthy eating and stuff at that point. And um, I was lucky. I, I had lost a significant amount of weight, got down to a healthy body weight, but then those kind of habits and stuff that I learned stuck with me because I started valuing myself solely on losing that weight. I kind of forgot about all my other accomplishments and stuff in life. And then I ended up losing both of my parents at young ages. Um, my mom passed away when I was 19, my dad when I was 11, which just really had a huge impact on my life. And when that happens, you kind of feel like you're losing control of everything. So I returned back to what I know best, eating healthy and controlling my weight and controlling my diet. And it just kind of continued to snowball over the years. And then once we hit the pandemic last year, um, it was like gasoline being poured on the fire. It just erupted because everything else fell outside of my control. So the only thing I could control was myself. And um, I just kind of, I became addicted to eating healthy, which is basically what orthorexia is. It's an obsession with healthy eating. And um, at the time, I didn't think I had an eating disorder because I didn't really fit the mold of the eating disorders that we read about in school or that we learn about. Um, I was like, I'm just eating healthy. I'm doing what I want to do to live longer, when in actuality, I was actually killing myself by continuing those unhealthy habits. Yeah, and I read in your post, um, your initial blog post about your story, where you said you had a colonoscopy appointment. Was that kind of one of the triggers that got you into seeking help? 
it was, it was. That was probably the catalyst to it all. Um, when I was 29, um, I had started developing some concerning symptoms. So I went to my doctor and uh, he scheduled me for a colonoscopy. My dad had passed away of colon cancer about 20 years earlier. So I already knew I was at high risk. Well, when they went in, uh, they found three large aggressive polyps um, that the doctor said only a couple more months and um, they probably would have been cancerous. And uh, it just rocked my world because here I was at 29 dealing with things that I thought I might have to deal with when I was 60 or 70 years old. And I guess seeing my own mortality flash in front of my eyes, I wanted to do whatever I could to stay healthy because I loved my life. I loved, I, at that time he was my uh, boyfriend, but my future husband and I loved our pups and I loved where I was going in my life and I didn't want to die. So I basically tried to be as healthy as I could to prolong that and stay healthy. So then, so you're falling into these habits of ultra healthy eating and it was then the pandemic start, you know, erupted in March, 2020 it probably um, the disordered eating became worse maybe. And then it was July, you mentioned in your blog post that was kind of like a, another turning point in your recovery or your um, in your story. Will you take us there to that weekend? Independence Day, which I, I find very ironic because it was my own day of independence looking back now. Uh, we had gone out of town on just a short little trip and uh, it was a typical trip with me. I just obsessed about where we were gonna eat. I was looking at Yelp, trying to find the healthiest possible option in town. Well, we found what I thought was gonna be healthy. Then I started analyzing the menu like I always do. And uh, I wanted to get the hummus platter with um, raw vegetables instead of pita. Well, they wouldn't substitute it. And I had a meltdown. Um, I was like, okay, then I'm just not gonna eat. And it was at that moment that Matt, my husband, he called me out and he, he recognized the pain that I had felt from my childhood and the adolescence and then the pain I was still inflicting on myself to this day. And um, it was in that moment that I realized it's okay to have this pain and to let it out and to get help. And uh, it was that very next Monday that I called my doctor and the road to recovery began. But like I mentioned, even at that point, I had no idea what orthorexia was. All I thought I had was just a really unhealthy um, relationship with food. Mm -hmm. So given the pandemic, were you able to see a counselor face to face or did you have to do telehealth or how did that go for you? Yeah, so I had to do telehealth, um, which is, it worked out great for me, but I found it very frustrating when I was looking for help because when my doctor diagnosed me, he just said to go online and look for therapists, but I didn't know if I needed to look for a therapist for the unresolved pain I had from my childhood, if I needed to look for somebody specific about eating disorders, I just didn't know where to look. And um, I got really fortunate that I stumbled across a therapist who was willing to learn alongside of me. Mm -hmm. He wasn't as well versed in eating disorders, but he was willing to go that extra step and work with me. And it was through working through my unresolved issues from childhood and the loss of my parents mm -hmm. that I was finally able to tackle this kind of invisible thief that had been stealing my life for so long. Wow, Jason, that's so powerful. And I think that so many of us don't think of that unresolved trauma that we've gone through. And that is the sign, I think, of a really good therapist is they help you go back and address it and come to a realization of, you know, where you are now too and what you were grappling with. Will you share with us how you identified and got to that diagnosis of orthorexia? Yeah, so um, I kind of stumbled upon it in a book. Um, I decided I've always been a very academic person. I always like to learn as much as I could. Mm -hmm. And um, here I was three months into recovery, but I still didn't know what I was facing. I was like, okay, you just want me to eat more, but I was already eating fine. So what's the problem here? And uh, in a book, I came across the term orthorexia. I had no idea what it was like most people do. So I did the natural thing and I Googled it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I Googled it, my life changed. 
that was the turning point. It was like, that is the thief. That's what I'm up against. Now that I know what the enemy is, I can defeat it. And that was just the turning point in my recovery. And that was a couple months after. So was that like this fall? Do you remember? Yeah, this fall. It was this fall. It was um, in October. So um, I had started recovery in July and it wasn't until October when I finally identified what orthorexia was. I went to my therapist. I went to my dietitian at that point. Neither one of them were familiar with it. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband had never heard of it before. Um, it was just uh, mind or life changing to realize that I was going through something for 20 years that I had no idea what it was even called. Wow. And, and so many people I think have, you know, expressed that of like, once they finally found what they were dealing with and, you know, we, we don't love labels. Nobody loves to have a label put on them, but identifying what you're dealing with is so crucial in understanding the right path to recovery. Cause then I would imagine you started seeking out uh, recovery resources for orthorexia specifically. Yeah, yeah. I started looking on a lot of the national eating disorder websites and uh, they were able to provide more information on orthorexia. And I was actually able to pick up the book by Dr. Stephen Bratman, who first coined the term back in the 90s, and read that book. And it just, his own personal experiences um, through talking with patients as well as his own life. Um, it was just so empowering to hear other people's stories and finally be able to relate to somebody. I had attended some support groups here in Denver um, virtually, but I always felt invisible because they were dealing with other eating disorders that I couldn't really relate to their behaviors and their habits. So it kind of made me feel like maybe I don't have an eating disorder, but it was once I was finally able to kind of connect with that orthorexic community that I realized the gravity of the situation. Well, and like you just said about hearing other people's stories, I can imagine the book is full of personal stories and anecdotes from people's journeys. Um, and then you took that leap. And what, tell us about what it felt like to decide to open up and share your story on a blog. And, and that happened first, and then you found This Is My Brave. So I'd love to hear both sides of that. So I was so frustrated. I was just almost angry, I guess I could say, the fact that I had never even heard of orthorexia before. That, um, and we live in a day and age too where healthy eating and clean eating, it's everywhere on social media. But for some of us out there, it's a slippery slope into orthorexia. So I was like, I've got to do something. I've got to, as Robin Roberts says, make my mess my message. I had to get out there and share my story. And it started with a, a funny little assignment with my therapist. He actually, I was concerned about telling my friends about uh, what I had been going through for 20 years. Um, I was worried that they might look at me kind of as a fraud, that I was somebody um, that I really wasn't. So he said, use your talents as a writer and write your story. So when I wrote my story, it was like telling my story back to myself. And I actually was able to give myself comfort and I felt I felt the pain of myself. It was like I was looking at my story objectively because I think a lot of times we often, we can give compassion to other people, but we can't give compassion to ourselves. So through writing my story, I was finally able to give myself the compassion I needed. And it just, it drove me. I knew that I needed to share my story. So I started reaching out to a bunch of people. Um, I would literally Google um, articles about orthorexia and then reach out to the doctors and the people that were quoted in there to get more information. And uh, one of them was Paula Quattromani um, at Boston University. Mm -hmm. And um, I spoke with her last week and she actually had recommended This Is My Brave. Oh and my it, gosh. Things where it clicked in my head. I was like, I've seen This Is My Brave before on social media. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she said that, I was on the website and I'm like, yeah, I'm just blown away by all the stories of the people that have spoke before me, all the alumni. And um, it's so true what you say about, um, well, hopefully one day we don't even look at this as being brave. We look at it as just talking because um, my friends will tell me that you're so brave for sharing your story. To me, I'm just talking. I'm just sharing. I don't feel like a hero. I don't feel brave. I just, I'm doing what I need to do to help other people so that they don't have to be held hostage like I was for so long.
Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so much about what we're all about. And I think of you, Jason, you are an alum of This Is My Brave. You know, you shared your story so beautifully on our blog. And I know that the, the feedback is going to pour in. And especially with this episode too, we're here live commenting in the, in the chat. So feel free to jump in with any questions if you're out there watching this episode and connect. Um, you know, because we're in this time right now where unfortunately we're not able to do live shows. So getting this opportunity to meet you and connect with you and bring your story to more people through our platform is an honor for us. And we're just so grateful to be, um, to be with you. So um, let me think. Uh, so you shared some resources. Are there any other resources that you hadn't mentioned yet that you might want to put out there for folks? Yeah, there are several just amazing books out there to read. Um, one of them was Permission to Eat by uh, Libby Parker, who's a dietitian, who herself also went through um, uh, disordered eating and eating disorders. And um, in her book, it just kind of makes you realize food is not the enemy. Food never was the enemy. Um, so that was, that was a huge key for me. It almost allowed me to fall back in love with food again. And then also um, Overcoming or Stopping the Voice in Your Head uh, by Dr. Reed Wilson. Uh, that book is phenomenal and it's not even eating disorder specific, but it allowed me to realize that the thoughts in my head, the inner critic and the negative thoughts that I faced for so long, they're somebody else, they're not me. So I was able to separate them. And uh, like she mentions in the book, you kind of turn it into a, a sporting event, which I'm a huge sports fan. I got to get that out there, go Hawks. So, <laughs> Um, but uh, it, it, you look at uh, the, those negative thoughts in your head as a competitor on the playing field. Every time you tell them no or you disregard them, you win a point. Uh, I love right that. Now. I never heard of that. <laughs> it is. It's a great concept, and it's one that I carry with me. So uh, right now, I'm looking to stay undefeated in recovery. Oh, such a great mindset. That's awesome. Well, I, like I said, I, before we jumped into record is um, having done some shows in Denver, we definitely want to get back there when we get back to the stage. And I think we might be chatting um, and staying in touch about having you help us bring another Denver show to the stage in the future. So thank you again, Jason, so much for connecting with us and sharing your story and um when to wrap up today, is there any one piece of advice you would give to someone? Think about someone who might be in the shoes you were in about a year ago. Like, what would you say to them in terms of um, coming to recovery with disordered eating? For me, the biggest takeaway right now is to allow yourself to be vulnerable. Um, you might seem like you're just laying it all out there and you're going to get nailed to the cross or people are going to laugh at you or disregard what you're feeling and they won't. Um, I have found just that all of my friends and my family and those around me are so supportive of me because being vulnerable has allowed me not only to get to know Jason again, but it's allowed those around me to get to know the Jason that I want them to know. And um, I would say anybody that's struggling with eating disorders or any type of mental illness, it's to be vulnerable. You don't have to hide. You don't have to continue to be unhappy. If you just allow yourself to be vulnerable, you'll realize just how strong you really are. That's really good advice. So Jason, thanks again. And thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Brave TV. And we'll see you next time on our next episode.